Okay, and we're going to move into the final main topic of this chapter, which is intelligence. And uh, I like to present the topic the way that it has emerged through history, through the history of intelligence um, research. We started testing this concept called intelligence before we have even re remotely agreed on what we're testing. So we're going to start off by talking about the testing procedures and the philosophies behind the, um, the design of these tests. And then we'll start going into some of the controversies surrounding, you know, the different types of intelligence and, you know, what intelligence really is. Okay, so let's start with testing. Uh, your textbook talks about Dalton and stuff, but I'm going to go ahead and jump right into Alfred Binet because he's the first person who designed a test that could be construed as something you would recognize as an intelligence test. His tests, he was hired by the French government to design a test that would predict success in school. He, um, he and the government basically had the um, perspective that intelligence would be based on experience. And so if a person scored poorly on this test, it didn't mean that they were dumb and would always be slower. It meant instead that they hadn't been exposed to the things that were being tested. And so uh, because the intention of the test was to predict success in school, the follow-up to poor performance would be remedial work to bring the child up to um, grade level. The French government was advocating that kids start school when they had a mental age that made them ready for school, rather than just throwing them in school when they reached a particular chronological age. So the purpose of the test was simply to determine who was ready to just get into school and who needed maybe a year of you know exposure to certain kinds of information that obviously they hadn't encountered yet in their lives. Most um, of the test takers would be, you know, four or five, six-year-old children who were getting ready to start their first year of, of school. I kind of, one of the things I kind of like about this test is that, um, you know, in American schools, if you have a child who was born after the cutoff for starting kindergarten, they really don't want your kid to start kindergarten until they've reached the, the correct age, even if you've got a kid who is advanced and ready. Um, this test would allow us to administer a test, see who's ready, and it doesn't matter if you're four or five or seven, right? It, when you're ready, you enter the same classroom. Of course, one of the implications of that is you'd have maybe four-year-olds all the way up to seven-year-olds all being in first grade. And in our society, that would be really difficult to manage. I don't know how well French schools could manage that, but for us, we like our, our grades to be full of kids who are all the same age, so it's kind of a problem. What his test was designed to do was to determine the mental age of the test taker. So to figure out what score represented what mental age, he got groups of children to take the test. And, you know, some of them were three, some were four, all the way up to, I think his oldest group was ten. And um, so he then calculated the average score for each age group. Now you as the test taker, when you take the test, your score is compared to this, you know, schedule of averages. And whichever age group you scored most like, that was your mental age. So uh, he was very much just trying to figure out, you know, where are these children operating and you know, what are they ready for? Now in the U.S., we had sort of a different take on the purpose of intelligence testing. This guy is Lewis Terman, and he was at Stanford University. He thought intelligence was genetic. You could tell that American psychologists were very much influenced by Darwin. I think I mentioned that way back at the very beginning of class, that you know American psychology started out as functionalism. And it was very influenced by Darwin um, because we asked the questions like, what's the function of different mental capabilities? Like, how does that help us to survive and adapt, right? So here we have Lewis Terman. This was 1910-ish, and you know Darwin had written his On the Origin of Species in 1880. Might have been like exactly 1880. So it hadn't been that long since this innovative new way of approaching things came on the market, right? And uh, 
so Terman was saying, you know, I think intelligence is one of those things that is genetic, that's inheritable, that's selected for, stuff like that. So knowing that that was his perspective, um, it really highlights the idea that um, he thought the purpose of testing is to distinguish among people who have a lot of intelligence, people who have normal levels of intelligence, and people who are lacking intelligence. And that this is a permanent state, you know, that this is a trait that you carry. Now what he did was he got Binet's test, and actually there were some intervening steps, so I'm doing some glossing, but he got Binet's test, which was written in French and had a lot of questions about French culture and stuff like that. And he revised it so that it was appropriate for an American audience. Um, once he got done doing the revision process, it started to be called the Stanford Binet after the university w which had the team that did all the work. He was the head of the team and then giving credit to Binet for being the original author. He uh, was the first one to um, develop a particular calculation that leads to what we now call the intelligence quotient or IQ. Binet had a, a, a calculation, but um, what, what um, Terman was able to do was set his, his, um, his little algorithm up so that you'd end up with an average IQ score of 100. So it's funny because in the US, we like to be above average. We think everybody should be above average, which statistically is impossible <laughs> by definition. Um, but we, so to find out that you have an IQ of 100, most of us would not trumpet that. We'd be like, oh man, I only have 100, right? That's an average, that's perfect. That's exactly where you're supposed to be, an IQ of 100. When I was in graduate school, one of the older professors came to talk to us. Um, he was, in fact, the guy who the psychology building was named after. And he was retired by the time I got there. Um, but he had been a big, famous psychologist back in the day. And he said when he was um, young, when he was college age, it was uh, World War II. And he went down to the, you know, selective service office and he took the tests and stuff that um, Terman had largely been um, in charge of developing for World War I and then they were extended for World War II. Um, and he took the tests and he scored uh, 102 points for an IQ score. So the Army decided that, you know, he wasn't qualified to be an officer or to fly a plane or something like that. So they assigned him to a desk job because he was just, he was, you know, good enough to handle secretarial kinds of, you know, record keeping and stuff like that, but, you know, not good enough to be like innovative and things like that. He says in retrospect, he's really glad he scored like that because had he fulfilled his dream and ambition, he might have, you know, gotten shot down and died in the, in the war. So, because he, he wanted to be a pilot. What's funny about this whole story is that, remember I set it up, big famous psychologist, right? He had been famous for innovating some techniques that had to do with learning in rats, and frankly, I don't do learning in rats, so I don't remember the details, and it doesn't matter. He, w he was a huge innovator in the field and was really famous during his prime, right? And to think that the Army was like, ah, oh, he wouldn't have the innovative, quick thinking intellect that we need in our officers or somebody to fly a plane. Um, IQs can predict certain things and they can't predict other kinds of things. You know what I'm saying? So it's, um, it's a questionable issue and it's something that we'll talk about more as we go on. The way that we calculate this, though, is we take your mental age, which I already belabored while talking about Binet, so I won't return to what mental age means. We divide it by your chronological age. That's going to give us some fraction. If you are, um, let's say, five, you are chronologically five, and you score like a four-year-old on the test. Your mental age is four. You're going to divide four by five. That's going to give us a point eight. Now, that's how uh, Binet would leave it when he did his calculations. So people would have IQs of 0.8. Or if we flip those numbers and said you're 4 and you score like a 5-year-old, then we're going to flip that over and you actually end up with a um, 1.2, right? And uh, Binet was fine with those fractions because, you know, you don't tell the test taker. You're just getting information about you want people who are at 1s or above because they're ready for school. 
Well, of course, ben, uh, Terman had a different goal with these scores. We want to be able to sort of quantify and report to people how they did, things like that. Nobody wants to see fractions. So he came up with the idea of multiplying by 100 to give us whole numbers. Um, when you see that, though, you realize, okay, if your mental age and your chronological age match, then by definition you're going to have a 100 for your IQ score. Now this kind of calculation can work even today for children because it's feasible to say that, you know, you're a five-year-old but you scored like a ten-year-old. I mean, you can kind of imagine that ten-year-olds should know more and have more sophisticated intellect and stuff like that than a five-year-old. Where we get into trouble is that Terman wanted to use this test to, on adults. So, uh, what is a 25-year-old quantifiably supposed to know that you wouldn't expect a 20-year-old to know? Education that's required is over with by the time you're 20, 25 years old. What could we say that you're supposed to know at 25 that we wouldn't equally expect you to know by the age of 20? So, for um, adults, we don't do this calculation. There's no mental age and chronological age. Instead, we just compare you to the norms and that's um, kind of a different thing. We'll talk about that in a little while. Um, so that's the history of intelligence testing and how, they, how tests were developed. Um, right away, people started criticizing intelligence tests as being um, not really related to real life situations um, because IQ tests include a lot of questions about um, knowledge, you know, what day is Independence Day, um, problem solving and fluid intelligence questions like putting together a puzzle or um, putting a series of pictures in order to tell a logical story, things like that, or abstract shapes and trying to figure out which one will come next, um, these kinds of logic based things. And a lot of people have criticized the tests saying that um, they're not fair to everyone. So. And they've also said they only tap, critics have also said they, they only tap into certain kinds of intelligence. So where we've come in recent intelligence research is to start looking at different kinds of intelligence and different kinds of ways to test different intelligences. So when we look at um, Sternberg, who for whatever reason, um, he always comes up with series of three to explain anything. He explains love using three components, he explains intelligence using these three, and I just recently saw him explain something else that was unrelated to either of those topics and he came up with three components to it. Um, oh, it was on uh, um, domestic violence and he came up with three components that can fuel domestic violence and it's like what what is your fixation with three <laughs> um, but he so he always thinks there's three um, in intelligence he says there's analytical analytical intelligence which is you know solving a problem that has an answer so it's a well-defined problem that has an answer and can you come up with it so this is the kind of intelligence that we use in math this is the kind of intelligence we use in logic problems, things like that. You have to analyze the problem and come up with the solution. Most intelligence tests assess analytical intelligence, um, problem solving, logic, stuff like that. Um, practical intelligence is something that Sternberg added. He said practical intelligence is expertise and talent that can help you to complete the task and manage the complex challenges of everyday life. I always like to call analytical intelligence sort of book smarts, you know, being able to do well in school kind of tasks. Um, practical intelligence is that sort of hard to pin down because it really depends on what environment you're finding yourself. Your ability to solve the challenges of everyday life. So practical intelligence is more like common sense or expertise that you've built up through years and years of experience with a topic. Um, and then our final kind of intelligence is creativity. Creative intelligence is our ability to generate new ideas to help us to, you know, adapt to novel situations or to, to solve a problem. Um, creativity, Sternberg's really careful to mention that the solutions that we come up with in creativity need to be useful. So he wasn't talking about like artistic creativity that makes things that people enjoy. Um, he's talking about you have a problem 
and you have to sometimes think outside the box to solve the problem. So that's what he's talking about there. So he says that we have these three different kinds of intelligences and that um, different people have these different intelligences in different to different degrees. Like for example, you might know somebody who's really book smart and really does well in school, but they're really lacking in common sense. You know, they have difficulty, you know, dressing themselves appropriately and things like that. Um, following hygiene rules and stuff like that. Or you might know somebody who's really book smart but not very creative. You know, they don't come up with novel solutions. They pretty much have to follow the directions. They can't come up with a off the, you know, off the chart sort of just do it yourself, figure it out kind of solution. Um, so you can have a high level of one thing. You could be very creative and then not very, not have a lot of common sense. Um, you, you can have equal levels of all three or you might be really good in one and, and relatively poor in another and that's the beauty of his theory is that it's not an all or one, all or nothing situation. Uh, okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop here because I think I've been talking for a while. So we'll come back and we'll talk about Howard Gardner. He even went beyond Sternberg and he's, he says there are eight different kinds of intelligences.